Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Interviews. Today, I'm very excited to be chatting with Hayley Joy Weinberg again. Now, those of you who are regular viewers will remember that I have already interviewed Hayley. And um, today, we're going to hear from her how things have gone since we last chatted. Um, I like to do follow-up interviews with my guests so that you can hear which of their plans worked out, which ones didn't, how they adjusted their course um, to uh, adapt to changing circumstances. So today, we're going to hear Haley's story and what she has been doing since I last spoke to her in 2020. Haley. How are you doing? How are you, Mel? I'm good. I'm back. I nearly Yay. died. I'm some fat little virus that's floating around. But I'm back and I'm good. And yeah, I'm really grateful to be sitting in front of you because it didn't seem like that was going to happen. Well done for surviving the virus. Sure. What can I say? What an ordeal that was. And, and I was so convinced when I got it, when, when, when I thought about it, that I would get it and I'd be fine and I'd just be a bit fluey and I would be fine. Well, I wasn't. I crashed completely, ended up in hospital on oxygen and oh my word, it was very scary. But yeah, but it was also very interesting. And what effect did that have on your business, Hayley? I know you run a busy factory um, and, and that you coordinate everything that happens in your factory. What happened during that period that you were hospitalized? So you know what, Mel, it's very interesting. Very, very interesting. I think as entrepreneurs, we all dream about having that perfect mix that if we're not there, the business carries on. But you never know, like, and especially when you're a, almost a one-man band like I am. So at the top, I coordinate everything. I've got an amazing team, but I am Haley Joy. So it is, it is difficult to imagine how could that function without me? Well, I am very pleased and very proud to tell you that they were phenomenal without me. They pretty much did three whole weeks with no contact with me, no guidance from me, no nothing. They wow. just got on with it. Wow. So they had, they had stock to replenish, which they did, which was great because we needed that anyway. And there was a lot of stock to because we were low. So I have a showroom space and then I have the factory space. And they're now all together since I gave up my store, my retail store last year. So Brilliant, who works in the showroom space, she does all the stock control. She just fed the factory what she needed and they just got on with it and they cut it and they made it. And she serviced the clients and online orders and WhatsApp messages. She did all of that. And I just I cannot tell you what it feels like after being in this game for like 35 years to know, like if I was sitting with my business coach and I told him the story, he'd be like, that's what I've been pushing you to do. Like yes. all the way, that's what I've been gearing you for. And it, it really is, an, it's such an integral part of upskilling a team mm. so that God forbid if anything happens to you, that that team can just, it may not be as fabulous as when you're in it, which it wasn't obviously because I do a lot of the sales, but let me tell you, they came up trumps. I'm so proud of them. I, I, I don't have words for the warmth that like washes over me every time I think that my team actually did it and it literally five weeks. So three weeks of no contact and then two weeks of minimal, like just feeding a bit of, you know, um, should we make this? Yes, make it, but change the neckline like that. But I mean, I hardly spoke to anybody. I could barely speak. So it was just incredible. And yeah, they stepped up to the plate big time. So big number one thing, when you start a business and you build a team, you must upskill that team. Mm -hmm. and, and I've proved that in the worst of times, my team came through unbelievably. That is so yeah. wonderful. That's so wonderful. Which, yeah, which exactly. systems that you have in place do you feel were key? So I think it's, it's that I share, you know, I like to, 
Mel, can we tell the brother in America, <laughs> can we just tell him that I'm on a, on a live record, well, I'm on a recording with Melanie on my work. Absolutely. <laughs> it's driving me mad. Okay, so Haley, you were telling us about upskilling your team. Okay, so here's what I always liken it to. I always talk about the glass castle that entrepreneurs tend to sit in. And one of the things that I've never done is I've never sat in a glass castle. I have always been in the trenches for want of a better cliche. I've cut, I've sewed, I've steamed, I've packed, I've invoiced, I've served, I've, I've done all of that. And I've imparted that knowledge. And I think that that's, that's key. Like you have to share your vision, your how, your why with your team so that when you're not there, they can just carry on and do it. And that's what they proved. They know how I like things done. They know how much, and that's an interesting one because if you think about it, like why would you discuss with your factory? So it's different if you see a team so if you do cut, make, and trim different because somebody else is taking care of all of that. But if you have your own production facility, why would it be important to tell your cutting, mainly your cutting department, why you like to have one small, one medium, two larges, three extra larges, six, two excels? You don't just tell them, you tell them why. So that when they kind of have to think on their feet, they can check with the showroom side, how many 2XL pants do you have? Oh, we've only got one in stock. Oh, great, we need to cut five. They don't need to put pressure on the showroom and ask the showroom, how many do you think you need? They've remembered or have written down what I know we need to have at any given time. And the reason for that is because we're a niche brand and we do plus size fashion, when an existing client reorders, they never order less than two pairs. When we get a new client that buys a pair of Haley Joy basic black pants and they receive them, they jump straight back on the online store and they order another four pairs because they're hysterical that they'll never get a pair like that, which I understand. I fully understand. As a plus size woman, I fully get that. So I am cognizant of that, but I've shared that with my cutting team for them to understand what we need in stock at any given time. And that's the secret to empowering. And what I'm telling you now goes deeper than just empowering. That's the real like sharing, but it came, it, it showed its worth so hugely because now, like today was an interesting one. We got an order for three pairs of 3XL pants and I went to the baskets and I was like, oh, please, it was an online order. So it's paid for. I want to ship it tomorrow morning. I went to the baskets and I'm like, please, can there be 3XL pants in the baskets? And there was the note. And there were the three, six pairs of 3XL pants. And I took them out and I gave them to production. I said, please, I need these by tomorrow. Like it just, you know, and that's the wonderful thing when, but it's what I say, you need to understand your business from start to finish. And you know what's interesting, Mel, is I've never really given myself credit for how much I know. And it's only over this last year and a half of lockdown and keeping a business afloat and keeping staff employed and all those pressures that have gone with running a niche business in a pandemic that I've actually taken ownership that I kind of know a couple of things. And I know them because I've done them all. Yes. And that goes back to the, if you want to call it control freak, I don't like to think of it as control freak. I like to think of it as an empowerment. I like to be empowered in every facet of my business. I may not do it as well as the lady who sews every day, but if she isn't there and I need to jump on, or we are massively busy. I mean, last year I ran a special on tops. I cut five, I hand cut. My cutting department cuts with machines. I'm not very good because I'm left-handed. So I can't see on that side of the, I hand cut. Take your finger off. <laughs> I just, it's like, it's very weird for me. But I hand cut 
500 mesh tops individually wow. to, to order. So it wasn't like I was cutting 22 excels. They were all to order. So I read one order. And, and eventually the production team turned around and said, who are you cutting all those tops for? And I looked at them and I said, every single one of these tops that I'm giving you is an order. Not one is for stock. 500 mesh tops that wow. came from, I ran this, this special to, uh, to my insiders list that I've got. So that was, it was really cool. But I cut all those tops because my production department and my cutting department were busy with a massive order for pajamas. We were doing pajamas and we were, we were like, it was crazy. So I couldn't flood the cutting department or I could, but then the pajama order would have, would have kind of got delivered a lot later than I wanted it to. So but the fact that I could, like I love that, that I could get on a cutting table and I could just cut for three weeks. <laughs> cut for three weeks. But you know what? I put earpods in, I listen to podcasts, and I just cut away. And it was it was reconnecting with the cutting table, which was good. And then I ran another special on some Haley Joy tops. And I ended up sewing all those tops together. Wow. So I sewed shoulder seams, put sleeves in, and then one of the production ladies very kindly, because steaming is not my favorite thing, I would have done it. <laughs> she very kindly offered to come in an hour earlier in the morning and steam an hour, half an hour earlier in the morning to steam, just because we, we do strange things at Haley Joy, we steam those things first. Like, I don't believe in putting a whole garment together and then trying to steam it. So, and then she packed them all and she packed them so beautifully for me, like a whole big pile like this. And I literally took them, closed the side seams, passed them back. It was just so nice that I could do that. But what it also does is it has another very big effect. It also just keeps your production on their toes when they realize that you can. Definitely. Very important. Definitely. And not, not because, you know, you, you fancy or schmancy. It's not anything like that. It just doesn't give anybody a big head or an illusion that they're indispensable to the company. Mm -hmm. And, and I, can I can sit on your machine and I can sew. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it also talks to productivity so that you understand what, the, what output is possible. In a certain time frame. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's so, I, I mean, it's crazy. So my production manager, I came, I came back to work part-time for a week and was weak. <laughs> and my plan on the, so that, that, then my plan was the following week, I'd try and go in for a couple more hours every day. On the Sunday, at the end of my first week, I got a message to say she wasn't feeling well. And she was nauseous. And blah. Anyway, it turned out she had corona. She didn't come to work. I kicked in on the Monday morning and went to work at 7 o'clock because our factory opens at 7.30. I opened at 7 because some of the girls get there earlier and we don't like them sitting outside. So I got there at 7 for the whole week, a week and a half, actually. I opened at seven and I got on the cutting table and I did all the special order cuts. The, the orders are there. I can't message the client and say, oh, terribly sorry, but my production manager hasn't come mm. to me. There's no plan B. I'm the plan B. But while I was cutting that, most of it was jackets with pockets. And I was like, really? Did I really design? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, if anybody knows what goes into a flipping pocket, sure, unbelievable, two pockets, to, I promise you two pockets to cut, mark, prep, put on, takes longer than putting the whole garment together. Two little pockets. So, <laughs> so has, has that kind of informed your pricing for that garment? Has it yeah, changed I mean, I how you feel about your price for that garment? No, because I know that we priced correctly. I mean, I would hope that after 35 years, I would, I would be like on that. But it just gave me a little bit more respect. And it also got me to just bank it 
But when I design something else, like we did, we actually put in a new sample today and she looked at me and she said, and we're doing it with the pockets, aren't we? And I'm like, yeah. We are <laughs> but pockets I mean, are great. It. No, pockets are great, Sela. Ladies like pockets and things. And pockets these days, you need pockets that are big enough to take a cell phone. Yeah, so, but that, I learned that, and then, what else did I, yeah, the marking of the pockets, holy moly, then we do a top, which, that is underpriced, I mean, realistically, I should actually scrap it from the, from the range, but it is such a brilliant top, and if you are new, you're a new plus size client, it is the absolute given that you will buy that top first, so it's called a pin tuck top. You should call it, it your gateway top. <laughs> the gateway to all Hayley Hay Joy clothing oh, geez, I tell you no it is a really scary top this. so it's got a yoke across here and then it's got 10 pin tucks in the front wow. and 10 pin tucks at the back 20 pin tucks that have That's to pocket. be marked plus it's got pockets plus it's got a front yoke and a back yoke plus it's got a binding around the neck plus it's got a hem band for a thousand and ninety nine rand, I'm like it should be ten thousand. <laughs> That's a crazy. <laughs> that is a crazy style. But that one also got me thinking. Oh, and Mal, I must share this with you. So, I so I knew now I've got this week, and um, I just have to hack it. And my staff kept saying, "Are oh, you okay?" So what I did was I'd cut two things. I'd go to my office. I'd sit in the chair and take a deep breath. Then I'd like get up, I'd go and cut again because I mean, I hadn't worked for six weeks. And like now I was like at this cutting table from, but you know what? When you have to do it, you do it. That's what I realized also. Like there's no, it's unbelievable the power of your brain. Mm. The power of mind is phenomenal. I mean, I did struggle like the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but the first day I was like, listen, I just got to hack this. Like there's no time to go and sit in a chair and take a deep breath. Like, <laughs> It's got to be done, but I want to, I have to share this with you. So we have a style called a 10 frill dress. Uh, it's worse than the pin tuck top. So it takes about two and a half hours to cut it. Um, and if you're cutting one, and I mean, we, we, we do make a bit of stock, but basically we make them to order because it's always colors and fabrics and weddings and all of that kind of thing. So it has, so if it's a, if it's a see-through, it has a front and back bodice and a front and back lining and then sleeves, which don't normally get lined. Then it has a skirt, a long skirt, and then it has 10 frills. But because it's plus size, and because I know how that dress needs to fit, every frill is a different shape. So you can't, just lay up, <laughs> you can't just lay up 10 layers of fabric and put one frill down and cut it. You have to cut every single frill individually. Okay, I mean, you can top tail them and if the fabric allows you to top tail. So my only thought when she messaged on the Monday to say, I think I've got Corona, I can't come, was, oh my word, there is one <laughs> on order that has to be ready by Friday. <laughs> so I left it on Monday, I left it on Tuesday, I left it on Wednesday. On Wednesday afternoon, I got home and my hubby works with me in the business. And he's like, how's the um, 10 for dress going? I said, first thing tomorrow morning, half past seven tomorrow morning, I'm cutting the I said, I am feeling stronger. You know, I went in and we cut the frills with an electric cutter so that they don't have, and I'm left-handed, so I don't cut very well as it is. Like I'm very, I tried one frill with the machine and I couldn't see on the other side, but there's no way I'm going to ever do this. I'm going to actually, I'm going to start a hyperventilate. I'm going to cut these frills by hand and I'm going to make sure that I don't have jagged edges. I cut 20 frills by hand. So the top and the sides were okay. It's just that bottom piece, because we don't finish them off. They just get chopped beautifully and the dress just hangs. I think it took me four and a half hours <laughs> to cut it. I did it. She came, she fitted it, she loved it. And I stood there and I thought, there we go. There, that's the men's for me. But you must know 
everything about your business. You don't have to know it as well as, as the designated people, but you must, because that week proved everything on top of everything else that had happened. So it's been a very interesting little journey. Mm, it sounds like you learned a bunch. Sure, I tell you, I did. And I learned so much about myself as well in it. And, you know, I think you think by the time you get 35 years down the line, can you learn any more? I learned loads. I really did. And I learned that I've got a fabulous team that I love so much. So one of the questions I've often wanted to ask you is how do you navigate uh, working with your spouse? Are we just really lucky? No. I need to rephrase that. I'm just really lucky that he is a very special human. Okay. So he doesn't sweat anything. He is one of the calmest, most measured, logical, accepting. He's a phenomenon, really. Okay. And I just got lucky. Very lucky. Okay. So, so, so you wouldn't that recommend that just any couple try this? <laughs> no, you've got, to be, you've got to be a balance. And the balance is, is that I, I mean, if you believe in star signs, he's a Virgo, I'm a Leo. So he's very like, you know, all the papers are in the right place and everything gets filed correctly. And I just throw everything in a checkers packet and hope for the best when I turf it out on Twitter. <laughs> so when we assigned roles in the business, I assigned all the things that I don't like doing. But actually, I mean, I say that in a joke, but I assigned all the roles that I'm not good at doing and that I know he's good at. So he handles, I, I always describe it like this. I make the money and I spend it well. <laughs> he is the voice of reason in between those two processes that manages the money. Okay. That's and brilliant. Over the years, yeah, over the years, I've actually just given that all over and said, you take care of that because it's not really my favorite thing. I, I love making it, but I don't even, like today, I don't even think when I'm having a sale, I never have this, this see the sale as money. I see the sale as making a difference in somebody's life and the money is just a byproduct of it. But I mean, I've worked, it's taken me a long time to get to that way of thinking. And I think when you get to that way of thinking and it works, the energy exchange that you have as a business owner with money, it becomes very balanced. And I don't, I just want to know that there's wages and there's rent and there's stock order money and anything over that, please put it in the savings account because there will be a rainy day. And let me tell you that last year in COVID, I had three months of rainy day money, thanks to that way of thinking, which was unbelievable. I mean, that's that I still believe that is what enabled me to go out with conviction and carry on selling to my to my crowd or to my tribe because I wasn't stressed like and and I wasn't spending hours filling in forms to get loans and TERS and UIF and all of that. I really do believe that that was a huge one. And then this year, in, this, in the month of July, we generated money until about the middle of July and then it dried up completely and we didn't have enough money to make the month, but we had a little bit of money in the savings account. Wow. So, so you and used your savings and you then replaced it again by now. Yeah. Wow. That's, more, that's discipline in the business. I'm very disciplined. I am very disciplined. And he being a Virgo and being who he is, we've, we've come, come from the other side where we have stressed ourselves into like stress balls because it's that month. And then there's, and then there's bond at that stage we're working at home. And we said, when we went into our retail store, we may made more money in our first month in our retail store than we'd ever made ever working from home and we both agreed that we would never ever get into that situation again there would always be it, I like to try and have one month's worth of savings that's always my aim if I can have one month of the wages the rent and the debit orders then I'm happy okay there's obviously there's no fabric and I don't buy anything on account 
So I don't, I don't owe any of that at the end of the month. But it, those things, if I can just have that for one month, then I know if anything happens, just breathe. And I did. I was able to get better because I wasn't stressing about how were we going to pay. And we had VAT at the end of, where are we now, August? No, we, we had VAT now. So we didn't have VAT in July, which helped. But yeah, the, the replenishing of savings is my most. I will forsake buying a roll of fabric for like 1,500 Rand. And I will say, I will look at it and we'll discuss it. And I'll say, okay, you know what? We're just going to skip buying that roll of fabric this week. Mm -hmm. That 1,500 Rand must go into the savings because we need to get it to X amount. Yeah, it's important now. And Corona taught us that. Sure, that lockdown last year taught us all that you have to try. It's not always, you know, I mean, it's, but it, it is a very important thing. And it's unbelievable how liberating it is when you can focus on your business and not be stressing about how you're going to pay at the end of the month. That's very, very useful information. Thank you. Uh, now, Haley, I'd just like to track back to something else that you said. Um, because I think it might be useful for other clothing manufacturers if they're watching. And that is, you mentioned that when you moved your business from home into a retail space, you suddenly made much more money. Uh, do you recommend that a, a fashion designer go into a retail space? Well, that's a tough one. You know, I had been working from home for 20 years before I went into a retail space. And I went into a retail space because I had I was bored, I was stuck, I, my clients weren't sharing me, they didn't want anybody to know about me, and I had had a life-changing event that when I was asked, what would you like to do, what would you really, really like to do that would, that would make you feel fulfilled? What came out of my mouth was, I want to go out and create a space for maligned women so that they've got a space to come to where they know that they're respected. And the woman who I said it to looked at me and said, well, I'd like you to go and sign a lease. And I was like, <laughs> I've never, I've never, like, no, I've never, I mean, I've never been in retail. How do you, anyway, cut a long story short, I signed a lease on 143 square meters and all my retail friends told me I was completely mad. But I, my vision was to create the space that was big enough for big women that when they came in, they didn't feel like they were bumping into things and that they were squashed. And that I had a very clear idea of what I wanted to do. So yeah, I opened a retail store. We were just, you know, we were doing a niche, a niche product and there was very little in the plus size market when I opened my store, very little. So they flocked in their droves. I mean, we we killed it. Like the first 10 years were like crazy at Haley Joy. We just like, because we were making, and also we were going up to a 7XL. So we were getting, you know, we were doing from a small, from like a generous small, all the way to a 7XL. So we were, we were really busy, but it was very brave and things have changed a lot now. Um, I think to share space might be a better idea, but shared space in a space that can breathe. So a couple of the shared spaces that I've been into are just, it's just too cluttered. Like I don't, like there's just rails and rails and rails of clothes. It's like there's no, I, I don't feel like I'm being respected as a, as a client. And also, I think the secret when you open a retail store is to be in your retail store. <laughs> because only you know how you want, whatever your product is, only you know how you want it sold, number one. Number two, you build relationships with clients that you would never build otherwise. And they can turn into phenomenal gold down the line. You also miss, and I, in the very beginning, I wasn't in my store. So for the, for the first like three years, I, I was at a cutting table cutting, which was a big mistake. I would never, ever advise that. 
Like you need to be organized. That's the one thing I did wrong. I opened a retail store and one seamstress and me cutting and I had staff in the store. Good. No plan. <laughs> like no plan. Like no, no plan. If this thing exploded, like was I going to get another seamstress in fast or was I going to be sewing through the night and the seamstress, you know, crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, know that. I mean, there we could talk about that too. That was just madness. I promise you, I opened the store in the August. By the, by the November, I nearly had a nervous breakdown. It was so mad and I just and then I started scaling but I, I couldn't see the wood for the trees when I eventually employed a production manager and employed four seamstresses and it got it I then went into the store and that's when I realized so you know you'll get like a lot of like newspapers and magazines and tv and come in if you're not there to talk to you and your staff say, oh, here's her business card. By the time they leave, they've forgotten about you. You're not there to make an impact on them. Whereas if you're there and you are the personality and you, you know, you're passionate and whatever, you're going to have a conversation with you. They're going to go away and remember you. So those are all the little things that I've like written down. If I ever write a book, those are the, those are the like little inner things, you know. Remember that you can't make, that's what I actually wrote. Remember that you can't make an impact if you're not there to impact. Mm, definitely. It's all good and well them saying, oh, you know, um, is Haley here? No, sorry, she's in the factory. Um, do you want me to call her? No, don't worry. Just give me a business card, I'll call her. Never hear from them. They forget about you. Whereas if you're swanning around and you're doing your thing, they're going to remember you. And then, you know, you can build a relationship like that. So, yeah, I think I would never say to somebody, don't open a retail store. But I would say you need some serious money like backup money and location so I opened I took 143 square meters in the back of a very old center mm -hmm. <laughs> in a back parking lot basically and I took that store because it was next to a restaurant and the guy who owned the restaurant had had a very, very successful restaurant in Norwood. And we used to hang out there three times a week. And when I found out that he had opened this restaurant in Dunkeld, I was like, it's a given. I'm going to open a store right next to him and I'm going to have instant clients. <laughs> when people go to eat, <laughs> they go to eat. They don't go to shop. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah and when, when people have eaten oily food, they don't want to try on clean you don't want them in your shop either <laughs> so so another another piece of advice never take a space assuming that what's next to you or around you is going to bring you clients you must be able to bring your own i that's what i did i brought massive clientele to to dunkeld i mean i used to do an advert in the built every month i can't tell you how many Clients from Pretoria, from Bloom, from like from all, it was it was incredible. So I brought my own clientele. So yeah, don't take a space thinking that because you've got McDonald's next to you, you're going to kill it. Oh, that's... maybe if you're making a burger, you might. But... <laughs> that's, yeah. that's such awesome information to share. Thank you, Haley. Uh, I know a lot of um, fashion designers are watching these videos that I'm doing, particularly with other designers. And um, I know that, that that's pure gold for anybody in the industry who's watching right now. So thank you. We all want, you know, that's the thing. Like, I think every designer wants to see their name above the door. I mean, it is lovely. It's an amazing feeling to walk in and there is your clothing hanging there. But you know, Mel, another thing that's so important as well. I had my own factory. Mm. I had full control. Mm. So I had control over over the quality, if they picked up a problem with the fabric, we knew about it. And just, I'm gonna share this with you because I think this is also valuable to remember when you're CMT. So I had somebody sewing for me and I mean, she was making really beautiful stuff that was selling a bomb. And she used to deliver every Friday afternoon and my hubby used to, she used to deliver to the house because it was closer for her. Hubby would come, he'd fetch all the stock, bring it to the shop. And by five o'clock in the afternoon, it would all be hanging and marked and ready for Saturday morning because I had a tribe of women who knew that there was new stock every Saturday. 
and they'd come in and by one o'clock, most of the, like we would get between 40 and 60 tops. And by one o'clock, like we would have sold out of almost three quarters of them. So it was such a brilliant relationship. And I would have thought that five years into the relationship, I would never have to check anything. She knew how I liked my clothes delivered. She knew the quality, blah, blah. And on a particular day, there was an amazing range coming and I shared with all the clients, oh my word, and I'd shown them a piece, a picture of the fabric. So there was, there was great excitement. Phone me first, I wanna be first, what time can we come? Can you open early? Like there was this madness that went on. So she delivers the tops, hubby brings the tops, he walks in with the tops and I've got eagle eyes. Like my eyes will pick up like the slightest stitch that's out. And I said to him, that label is skew. And as he pulled it down, I saw the next one and the next, all the labels had been sewn in like this. Now, my label has got, it's a stupid label, actually. It's got like a five mil of, let's say, gray. Then it's got a Haley Joy. And then it's got a Joy underneath it that's gray as well. If you don't sew that label in straight at the top, you get black, gray, black, gray. These have been sewn in like this. So, I mean, they were... Just, I promise you, I burst into tears and I don't cry easily. Burst into tears from frustration. I looked at this and I'm like, how the hell I can sell them like that? Because I promise you, the clients are so excited for this fabric. They're not going to notice the label, but it's not the point. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think is unbelievably important. The relationship that you build with your CMT factory, mm -hmm. like it has to be, you have to put in the time to build that relationship and building it is informing them what you like and what you don't like because when you create a space with your name above it and you've got all this clothing hanging there when you're selling if you're on the floor selling which I advise every new designer existing designer established designer who's going to open a retail store sell your clothes yourself so you get to understand what works and what doesn't work or empower your staff to the point where they are confident enough to tell you that something is not good. Mm. But really, I think it is most important, whether you can sell or you can't sell, doesn't matter, be on the floor and see the garment on and see how the neck fits and see how the armholes fit and whatever. Because that's so important for how you're going to build your retail store. And if you're going to go into having 10 retail stores, you want to know that your cut and your fit and all of that. There's so many things to take into account. You don't just go and sign a lease. By the time I signed a lease, I had an established pattern collection and range that we knew fitted like a dream. Mm -hmm. Then you can go and bomb a whole lot of stock into a store and know that you're good. But if you take a chance, sign a lease, and you know, I'm going to be a fa famous fashion designer, so I'm going to design all these avant garde. And then you put them in the store and you never see them on. And then you can't understand why your staff aren't selling them. Mm -hmm. So important. Mm -hmm. Because you can't name the staff if you've never seen how that garment fits. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's that's more pure gold. Thank you. Um, so, Haley, before we run out of time, I would like to touch on one more thing. Just before we started this recording, you mentioned that you, through your near-death experience with COVID, had a revelation about your business now going forward. Would you like to chat about that a little bit more? Yeah, I'm going to take a sip of water before I do that one. Alarms from a tree. So proud of my lunch. Oh, it just gives and gives and gives. It's one of those. <laughs> so Mel, one of the things that I can cringe about, or could cringe about, was my online store. And it, it's, it's a story. So I run very successful WhatsApp lists. I've got 860 odd women on these lists. And that's where I do my selling. And it works for charm for me. It's personal. I don't share the videos that I share with them anywhere else. Those videos only go there and that's it. And I sell instant there. But of course, you know, you had to have an online store. And yes, during COVID last year, the online store was a winner. But I've never really given the, the online store 
the Haley love. I give the WhatsApp Haley love. I have phenomenal response to my Facebook lives. So I give lots of love to Facebook lives when I do them. But the online store was the real orphan in the family. So while I was dying, <laughs> I just thought, you know what? I've come back from this. Like I really, I mean, it was very, very close. And I came back and I just thought, okay, you know what? I am going to give this online store. I made a deal with my universe. I said, I'm going to give the online store the Haley love. And in return, you are going to prove to me that I can sell a niche product like plus size clothing online. So a couple of weeks before that, I'd been in a networking group and there was a guy who did WordPress websites and we, we got a minute each. And he said to me, so I know a bit about you. I know you do this phenomenal thing on WhatsApp. I've seen a Facebook Live. Your Facebook Lives are great. It's like the Haley show. He said, I'm just going to tell you honestly that your website is not representative of you at all. Mm -hmm. And he said, and if anybody tells you that a website is different to a, not when you're doing what you're doing. He said, I go onto your website. I do not see Haley anywhere on the website. Mm -hmm. And he said, it doesn't talk to me. It doesn't, it doesn't give me any reason to actually stay there. Mm. He said, so my advice is go out and change it. So in my conversation with my universe and my commitment to, I said, okay, I'm going to draw it. I'm going to draw the vision I have. And then universe, you're going to send me somebody that's going to help me put that vision together. Mm. And I'm very proud to tell you that that's exactly what happened. I'm working with a phenomenal young guy who gets me, gets my multi-potentialite personality that changes every hour and hasn't tried to influence me, hasn't tried to tell me that anything's wrong. He will advise me on sizing. He'll advise me on layout. He'll, but everything I've sent him so far, he's come back and gone, I love it. I'm adding it. He adds it. I go in, I open it up and I'm like, I love it. Like, I love it so much. And this is a huge thing for me because I've had my online store for six years and I've never loved it. And I haven't given it any attention. So we kind of load the dregs on there. You know, every now and again, I'll say to my hubby, oh, there's a new top, load it. And then we'll load it and then we set it out in two days and then we'll take it off and then we never replace it and whatever. So now I've got a completely different plan. I am going to make a separate small range for the online only. We're going to hide it and it's only available online or if my existing clients see it online and they want to buy it directly from me, that's fine. But I want to be able to keep the online store loved. And there's lots of me all over you. you when you go in once it's live, I mean, we're still busy working on it. But yes. oh, have I worked? Oh, my word. I've been designing on Canva for days. <laughs> yes. So I do one thing, one label with something on it, then I send it to him. Or I put it in the, in the media library and then I message him and I say, okay, it's in the media library. He's like, cool, he's going to load it. Then he loads it. Then I go in and I look at it and I'm like, Mm, that top left corner is not 100%. So then I delete it. Then I go back into Canva and I do whatever I do. Then I put it back in the media library. I say, okay, I've done a new and updated one. And that's how it's been. Now, after two days, that first section is perfect. The perfectionist thinks it's perfect. It must be perfect. So, yeah, and it's just that feeling of, of committing and then taking it through. But there's a big but here. I am only able to take it through because I'm working with somebody who is unbelievably respectful of my creativity. And unfortunately, this is something I can't do myself. I can't build the back end. But what's happened in the past is I've kind of been told that, you know, your website must look like this. And your Facebook can be you and your Instagram can be you, but your website. Now, 
I'm making the website all about me because I've had not one person tell me that. It's, I understand it, that if, you, if you're with me on WhatsApp every week and I tell you that I've uploaded a new talk to the online store and you go to the online store and like, it's two different people. Mm-hmm. Now it's going to be cohesive. But more than that, when I'm doing an interview like this and I, and I give the, the online website, when I give the online, when I give the website, like I'm, I will be proud to do that before. Every time I used to, just before I'd give it, I'd be like, inside, I don't want to do that anymore. And I think that that is hugely destructive mm-hmm. in any part of your business. And, and it feeds, it feeds everything because like I would do a WhatsApp video and then somebody would message me and say, I've just been on your online store. There's nothing new. Mm-hmm. And then I'd feel that feeling. Mm. At like we are really, really not doing this that side of the business any justice. Plus, I'm doing some stuff overseas. I'm doing a couple of interviews. I did a talk on um, diversity and inclusion in the workplace around size and shape. Oh, and I'm wonderful. Like, yeah, but I'm like, you need to have a decent <laughs> website to drive people to. Yes. You know, you can't go and talk to, I mean, I, I spoke to two and a half thousand people. You know, in America, it's all bigger and better. Yeah, I mean, yes. it's in a zoo. But I'm like, how can you drive them to a site that looks like it used to look? So, <laughs> so yeah, so that's my, my big news is I'm on a major revamp in the website and I'm loving every minute of doing it. So your big news is actually that you almost died and have decided to level up. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, there's no time now. Like, I mean, I was this close to dying with a shitty website. <laughs> now, now, if I died, I would die happy knowing that I've got this really. <laughs> <laughs> You're amazing. You're amazing. Oh, your no. your resilience and your enthusiasm for what you do is so contagious. It's wonderful. Thank you. Yes, that it's. You know it's what I mean? I mm-hmm. love every, still 35 years later, I love every minute of going to work because I keep it interesting. I, I love my clients. I love what we do. I love the difference that we make, but I love going to work. And that's a huge thing to be able to say 35 years in, but it's because also what I've done, and I think maybe we'll do that in our next, maybe you should just make a note. To remind <laughs> me, is that I think it's, it, it's very much about if you, if you love what you do, yes, you can only love it if you have orchestrated it to work for you so that you can love you can't love something that that is just filled with never-ending drama so i and we'll we can we can chat it's a good one to talk about as well you know in the old days i did i had all of that and then what i've done slowly is i've done that and i only do and see and indulge what works for me and makes me happy because if I book an appointment with a supplier that I don't I don't really want to see them but I feel sorry for them or they're a big nag or they just have a way of getting themselves in I will wake up tomorrow morning in a in a crappy mood I'll think of every excuse in the book not to go to work I stopped all of that and that's a really important thing to touch on as well I just thought about it now. I think that's a fantastic conversation. And um, we'll have to have it next time because we've run out of time. (laughs) Thank you for accommodating me. (laughs) Hayley, accommodating you. You are so generous with information and and so such a wealth of experience to share from i'm super thankful uh for for everything you share thank you so much for co-creating great content with me yay i love it and i love you and i love sharing space with you and i know we're still going to do fabulous other things together let me just get a fabulous website that i'm proud of (laughs) survive covid survive covid that's that's all I ask of you right now. Yeah, so, no, I'm good. I'm yeah, back and I'm good. Yeah, live to play another day. Live to play another yeah. day. 
Anyway, thank you so much, Haley, for that wonderful conversation. And I look forward to chatting with you next time so that we can uh, track your progress and uh, cheer you on. Well, just think next time we chat, I'm going to have a crazy, wonderful website. Yay. And we'll share it in the comments when it's ready. Yes. <laughs> cool, Mel. Lots of love to you. Take care. Okay.